Now, guys, before we get started on this week's podcast, I want to talk to you about our Momentum Mastermind. The Mastermind is our 12-month program for men who want to surround themselves with other committed men, all with similar interests, values, and goals. Whether you're looking to build or grow a profitable lifestyle business, develop financial freedom, get in the best shape of your life, or create an intimate and epic relationship, the Mastermind is perfect for those who are looking to have it all. We know that to create these results and this kind of lifestyle on your own can be super challenging. So join now for your free 30-day trial. Simply visit our website, www.themomentumlifestyle.com.au. Up the top, you'll see a section for programs. Click on the programs, you'll see our mastermind and you can sign up there now for your free 30-day trial valued at $1,000. We look forward to seeing you part of the mastermind. Phoebe Coon, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Blake. Great to be here. Where did we cross paths first? Did we do Spiral together or were we in the extended community or did I just make all of that up? I think extended community because I thought about that this morning, but I don't remember you being at the same practitioner training as I. I think you would have been earlier. What a wild um, time that was. Um, We've got a lot to talk about today. Lots of business chats. I love, um, we've kind of been in and out of each other's world for yeah, however many years that is now, but I've come back into your world recently and and loving um, what you're putting out. So before we get into all things business, can you give the guys a 60 to 90 second spiel of your life and what's got you to where you are now? 60 to 90 seconds. Wow. Okay. There you go. Points. So uh, yeah, previous corporate like background was in project management, e-com, advertising, started learning more about personal development, self-mastery, did a couple of practitioner trainings, journeyed out in 2018 as a transformational life coach, had a 15 to 18 month tumultuous start, rocky start, and then eventually kind of came back around into the marketing background and started doing content marketing and then eventually teaching that. Uh, The last three years, I have had this brand called The Content Emporium, where I've been teaching primarily like online entrepreneurs, a lot of coaches, healers, people with service businesses, how to clarify their messaging, you know, create content, how to write copy, brand strategy, um, and really arming people with a lot of the the skills and also the mindset to complement and the be- the behavioral strategies to complement uh, their business growth. So um, yeah, what I do now is pretty encompassing. It kind of niche down really hard and now we're going a bit broader and um, there's been human design and and human design for business at one point in there as well. Um, and now there's, a, I would say there's a lot of like business mentoring strategy, a lot of behavior, and even now a little bit of investing and branching out into to other arenas and working on other projects as well. So lots of entrepreneurial endeavors. I love it. The um, 15 to 18 month um, tumultuous period, I think was the, the terminology that you used. What um, unfolded there for you? There was a real lack of knowing exactly what to focus on and how to, like, what is the process of building a business? Like, what do I need to do? What do I focus on? What's the checklist? And, you know, how do I actually market, you know, in a way that allows me to kind of create any kind of sort of consistent income, right? And so a lot of the marketing knowledge that I had that I learned, you know, from agencies and and corporate background was all relevant to large businesses, right? So it's like, once you have an established marketing ecosystem, you send these emails every week, you know, you do this, but what happens when you're literally starting from scratch and you're growing and you're trying to get your first clients, you know, what do you do that is free and not paid marketing? And so there was a lot of massive gap in knowledge. And then also, I think the biggest thing is that when I think anyone, most people start a business, it is a very unfamiliar process And you need to be in the right environment and you need to also have the identity of, I am now coming out of this loop of being an employee where something is constantly coming to me every month and I'm being told what to do to then having to learn self-governance and self-leadership to figuring out, I need to lead myself and figure out what I need to do. And then eventually, you know, as the business grows, lead others. So that journey of figuring out how to, really build the like the mindset of a business owner and the mindset of a CEO, the mindset of an entrepreneur was something that I needed to learn how to do. I didn't even know that I needed to do that. So there was a lot of stumbling around and, you know, trying to figure things out. And eventually 
that I met someone that was like, this is why you're not making progress. This is why you're procrastinating. This is why you're not building momentum. And I was like, oh my God, do other people know this? It speaks so well to the fact that so many of your business problems are actually personal problems wrapped up as business problems. And you, you spoke to the kind of identity piece. What's what's the shift look like? Um, and I assume potentially you might've even had to reinvent yourself a couple of times. What's that shift look like from start to you know the one year period to the three year period? And if I got my maths right, somewhere around the five year period now. I, I personally have like a bit of a framework around this where I feel like there is an evolution of emotional maturity of the ego. And I also, so there is a developmental process, right? So in the same way that we become an adult, you know, we, we have to first go through being a teenager before we become an adult. And then we have like a real maturity. So that maturation process is something that is mimicked with the development of the ego. And I think that's really important to note because there are nuances to the entrepreneurial journey when it comes to growth, because one aspect is the health of the ego and understanding the motivation that is driving the business. And so, you know, if we have an ego that is seeking for attention, significance and validation, and it's, you know, looking to prove something and it's trying to move away from pain rather than being inspired by love and desire and you know there's there's not a moving towards there's a moving away from motivation then we're in a stage of development which is more resounding to child or teenager and so there is a maturation process that needs to happen there and until that maturation process occurs there is always business is always going to feel difficult or painful or frustrating and there's going to be a level of tantrum and emotional response and reactivity and so one side of business is very much the emotional side which is navigating how you feel within that context how you feel within your relationship to the business and then the other side is the execution right so this is like how productive and how effective are you at executing on the tasks that need to get done in order to build the actual doing. So the emotional maturation is in the being and the execution is in the doing, right? And so in order to execute, because not everybody is a great executor, how do you become a great executor? Well, a lot of the time, you know, the one main piece of behavioral code is that people will procrastinate on something for a very long time or there's never enough time, it's, I'm too busy, there's always this thing that is a higher priority, this thing that comes up. And what most people fail to realize is that the lack of time, the lack of space, the lack of everything being appropriate is unconsciously created as a behavioral strategy to keep people safe into what is familiar. So understanding that this is actually like this external reality is completely created by what the mind is going to be willing to deal with is then the beginning process to mastering the internal game of going, am I going to win today? Or is the little gremlin or like the shadow or, and it's going, can I override these safety responses and these mechanisms to veer out and go into new territory that has not been charted? Because the process of being an entrepreneur is about creating from nothing. It's about creating from scratch. You know, usually most of us are pretty self-made or we're creating with no capital. We're creating the capital ourselves. Oftentimes we're innovating, we're creating products that have never been created before. And so everything is new. Everything is fresh. There's no roadmap. There's no template. And in order to do that, in order to create at that level of consciousness, there needs to be a, a comfort in the discomfort. There needs to be an ability to operate in the unfamiliar when you don't know what's going to happen. Nothing is predictable. Nothing is consistent. And that's the mental piece that needs to be learned. And when that is learned, then you could go through and recreate new identities to help you adapt into whatever it is that you want to create. Um, and, and so that's what ultimately is to happen in terms of the, the executing, the doing. I don't say this often on this podcast, but that was like, who are gold. I don't know if you've practiced that speech, but it was fucking on point. I really <laughs> just came, I was like, as I was saying, I was like, yeah, this is good. <laughs> this is good. This is just flowing through. So uh, if you're listening to that, I'd go back and listen to it the three times just to pick up everything that was just said because that was magic. So to go 
to loop back and use yourself as an example, one of the things I want to acknowledge, and I don't know if this has been acknowledged in you, because we do kind of mix in um, similar circles in terms of how big the coaching is, is the level of um, groundedness and clarity that you energetically you put out to the world is brilliant. And again, I'm sure you can kind of be witness to this. There's a lot of ego in the coaching space, which comes from, a, it feels very ungrounded and just the way that you just delivered then just really just to kind of honor that centered, grounded, powerful speech that you put together that I think you should go back and write out. I just want to honor that before we get going. Um, talking of ego, when you think about your own process in creating or recreating or ego deaths or however you kind of position it what what's that process looked like for you over a a five-year period when it comes to your relationship with the ego so over the last five years I would say there have probably been two distinctive moments um you know some people might call it an ego death some people might call it a quantum leap um I don't like that type of languaging um so I don't really use that sort of language but what I can say is that there has been a very distinctive identity shift uh followed by a a a massive change in circumstances income what was created and, and level of ease and flow afterwards so the first major one was November December of 2019 and that was when I started working with my first really good coach and the I so we did a roles integration. Have you are you feeling with that? You've done one of those? Yeah, you teach. Yeah, you do mm. this all the time. Yeah. So in the roles integration, I let go of the identity that I had coined to be drama llama. So I was like, okay, well, I need to release this identity of someone that is just, you know, kind of getting into all this mischief. And I need to embrace the identity of someone that's almost even a little bit boring, like actually just getting it done, head down, be productive, executing. And being okay with not getting the validation from being this interesting person. So there was a real maturation there that was like, I am seeing the value in growing and in maybe not being so intense and not so funny and not so interesting and captivating. And I don't have, you know, I, I need to seek validation in healthier ways. And so I would say that that was like the first major kind of shift where my ego was starting to dismantle and become aware of how it was seeking attention in ways that were in conflict um shares from October around October of 2021 so about two years later and the October 2021 shift was very like painful and challenging and I really didn't want to let go so in terms of like emotional evolution and journey I would say that that was when I really kind of came into my adulthood and into like a more wise grounded space because that was there was there was a a protection mechanism that was coming up and protecting at all costs that was like we cannot open the basement door we can't let anyone in and what was happening was like every time someone would start to get close whether it was like an intimate relationship or whether it was a coach I would put my walls up get super defensive and push them away and then blame them to justify why, you know, people can't be trusted. And so part of, you know, the the ego's whole job is to protect itself and it's sneaky. It's very clever. It knows, you know, it's like a little ninja, right? So trying to outsmart the ego is very challenging because it usually will have a higher level of awareness than you. It will probably, you know, dictate how much awareness you have. So there's a lot of dismantling and then they're, they're really in order to override and dismantle the, the true power of your ego's desire to defend itself, you have to be so willing to give up all of those defenses. You have to be so done with the frustration and the pain of your own shit. Like you have to be absolutely fed up with yourself. I think a lot of the time you have to get to breaking point. And if you're not quite at that point of like enough is enough, you'll keep playing the game. 
with with this thing you know and you'll keep dancing around it and not quite getting there maybe almost getting there and this is where most people are I had a client past client message me yesterday and she was like you know I've, I've just started to sit down and do some some mindset work and she was like this is really hard and I was like did you did you did you think it was going to be easy <laughs> This is really cute. Um, you know, this is the whole reason why people don't have what they want is because it's hard. It's it's the hardest thing that you can do is navigate that internal landscape with yourself and be like, am I willing to go to war with me? And mm. so, you know, yeah, that that process over the last five years was getting to a point of maximum pain where my relationships had completely broken down up until 2021 at that point. My relationships with my team had completely broken down. I had lost all finances. And so I had nothing. You know, I had literally lost everything. I'd lost friendships, four close friendships, my my closest friends, completely disintegrated, love disintegrated, business disintegrated. And I, I actually got to the point where I was looking at myself in the mirror and I was like, I don't even really like you that much. Mm -hmm. And so I had nothing left to lose. And I think when you get to the point where there is nothing left to lose, it's, it's quite easy to walk through the door, but most people don't get to maximum pain and they're kind of willing to dance around for a little bit longer. And so most people just end up in the dance for a long time. That's magic. I want to come back to that um, first, we'll call it an ego evolution. I can't remember the language that you used. I think the name was drama llama. What needs to happen for you to see that clearly and what's the process of evolving that? So was it a blind spot for you when you needed a coach to kind of bring it to light? Did you see it clearly and you kind of wrestled with it? Like what, what what's that process in there when you face up with the ego and decide that you want to sh- change direction? Shift, yeah. So back then, I there's no way that I would have been able to see it myself. I did need a guide to reflect that to me. Um, where I am now in terms of awareness, things tend to come to me quite rapidly. And so I usually, if I just ask a question or if I set an intention now, I'll, I'll usually just receive clarity quite quickly, or, um, I'll receive the answer or some kind of guidance and things happen very quickly now. But, um, a couple of years ago I did, and even, even a year ago, I did need someone to reflect back to me the patterns of behavior that I was in because I wasn't willing to see them. Uh, There was some willingness, but I wasn't able to really see it. And then, you know, yeah, someone to reflect back to me, this is the role that you're kind of playing. This is the idea, like, you know, the identity that's sort of, and this is what the motivation is. And then they'd say like, you know, well, can you see that? And I would say, oh, I can see it. Uh, I've been, I've been in a process of reflecting on and setting intentions around what I want to build in the next chapter of my life. And so I've been allowing consciousness to kind of do its thing and, you know, know what it needs to do. And then on New Year's Day, I had this awareness and it was basically like, this is the identity that you've been holding on to and and grasping at and clutching. And in order for you to embrace this new chapter of your evolution, you need to let go of that identity. Um, And the identity was playing the marketer and realizing that so much of my um, validation and significance and safety was coming from being a good marketer. And then now this week, uh, dismantling that with, with journaling and, um, you know, even from a body perspective with breath work to just get my nervous system on board and teach my body, like, yeah, we are supported. You don't need to drive the ship. You can actually let go of this business that you've spent four and a half years building, but it's not even let go. It's you can trust the people and the processes and the systems that you've built. You can trust the people that you've invested your time and energy and leadership into to support and drive this ecosystem so that you can rise up into, you know, your higher level of of role and responsibility. And in order for me to do that, I need to let go of a lot of the the day-to-day in the marketing, which had previously given me so much validation. People would be like, who does your marketing? It's so good. And so, you know, it's like, well, where's this validation going to come from now? You know, and then shifting that because as long as there's a payoff, you need, that's what you need to be aware of, right? So it's significant and potentially, I think in the personal development, I was literally having a conversation with a client before this, underestimated the 
importance of understanding the identity and shifting on an identity level. I really think it's heavily underestimated. So what's your relationship like now with the ego? And I know for a lot of people, uh, uh, one of the challenges of shifting the identity and or the ego, depending on how you kind of see them, is the attachment and the validation and everything that comes with it because it served you so well for so long. So how would you describe probably the dance with the the ego and the identity for you now as opposed to how that might have looked five years ago? So because there has been so much continuous evolution over the last, I would say like two years in particular or the last year and a half in particular, there is far less attachment to an identity to define who I think I am. And so there's there's more shape-shifting and malleability to kind of traverse through identity as a as an archetype that I choose to to wear for a temporary period of time as long as that serves me and it kind of gets to be like a cape you know like whereas I think for a in general I think most of the population are taught in school that there is this construct of the personality and the personality being fixed who are you well I am my personality And that does not actually encourage any kind of growth or change. So the whole way that psychology, you know, social psychology and constructs are taught in school is very much to reinforce that you are who you are. And let's do these like Myers-Briggs personality tests. So let's do these like archetypal astrology tests so that you can find an archetype that can define you forever. Rather than here are things that you get to play with and embody when you choose to because you're all of it so we're not taught that we're the whole universe you know we're not taught that we are in in the vast sea of consciousness we're taught that you know we are separate and because we're separate we need to define ourselves and then we become attached to that definition I think a lot of people will experience identity crises throughout their life when they are no longer resonating with the construct that they've been taught should be somewhat permanent. And I think a lot of people, when they go through um, relationship deconstructions, you know, like a a marriage ends, you know, or a long-term partnership breaks down and they go through this grieving process, not necessarily because of the relationship. I'm sure that's there as well. But I think a lot of the time people put themselves through unnecessary additional pain because they are grieving the identity of, but I'm this person's wife or I am a mother, and they're they're attached to the archetype rather than going, yeah, this is a role that I play and it's part of everything, but it's not me. And so I think there needs to be a malleability and and an ability to put on and take off and see that this is just a, it's just a role, you know, it's not defining, it's not attaching. And I mean, there's a really great book that I reference a lot in conversation, which is Psycho-Cybernetics. And it's ultimately this concept of the way that we see ourselves and our self-perception. Like if you see yourself as the villain, you're going to keep perpetuating that you're the villain. You know, you're this bad person that is unworthy of love. And whatever you see yourself as is ultimately what becomes true, you know, and and this kind of like this concept of like surgery, right? A lot of people will get um, surgery to change and alter their physical perceptions, but then they don't internally feel different even though physically they look radically different. And so why is that? And it's because their self-image hasn't changed. Juice, absolute juice. So when you think about the um, ego, the archetypes and how you might have shifted over the last five years, and obviously you hold them a lot looser than the attachment and the meaning that you used to give it, but how would you see the evolution from our ego persona, identity, archetypal journey that you've been on over the last five years? So I say that the big thing in terms of trying to define the evolution would be the difference between moving away from pain and so being in a survival response where there is a need to survive to protect itself. And so most of the motivation is being driven by avoiding risk, you know, seeking safety and preservation. And that's going to result in a lot of unhealthy behaviors or it's going to result in accidentally hurting other people. Or, you know, when we make decisions usually to avoid pain, it will somehow always create 
more pain. There will always be some kind of lesson because what is always occurring is this like feedback. And so the feedback is like, well, if you can't handle, you know, if you keep avoiding the pain, then I'm going to teach you the lesson of more pain. And so creating a life of meaning and fulfillment, something that is joyful requires this evolution of going my personal philosophy now after having you know spent some time here is that the way forward and and the path to mastery is about building as much tolerance to pain as possible like whatever you are most deeply afraid of whatever is most physically emotionally mentally spiritually uncomfortable for you the more you try to avoid that, the more it will come back and amplify, right? And so if you go, well, I'm actually willing to look at this. I'm willing to feel it. I'm willing to maybe even take it on and go, fucking, I'm going to sit in this and I'm going to actually go, how much can I take? And almost even get kind of kinky with it, right? Where it becomes this really interesting game of what can I endure? When you change your relationship to pain, you also change your relationship to pleasure equally, right? And this is kind of like one of the concepts in existential kink. But if you then go, I am not afraid and I'm not going to let fear run my life, then everything suddenly opens up and becomes your oyster because ultimately most of us are in self-preservation. We're trying to survive. The ego lives to not die. We're simply trying to live to fight another day. And so if we go, well, what if I don't fear death? What if I no longer fear rejection? What if I no longer fear abandonment? How would my relationships change if I no longer feared rejection or abandonment? How would my relationship to money and success change if I no longer feared failure? If I no longer feared not being enough for my parents? If I no longer feared never amounting to anything and never amounting to my fullest potential, how would my relationship to success and money change? How would my success to fame change? And so all of these relationships that we have with the external world can be completely deconstructed and reconstructed in very healthy ways where there is a lot more room to create when we are no longer being driven by fear and self-preservation. And so the path is sit in and meet as much of your pain as you can so that it's no longer running you. You become the master. This warms my soul. I'm actually going for a mushroom ceremony to deal with abandonment, fear and rejection in Two weeks time so you are speaking my language my friend you are speaking straight to it when it comes to execution how has your ability to execute changed as you've evolved yourself over the last five years yeah it's it's very powerful now and it was not always you know like I've always been quite an action oriented or goal oriented person so there's always been a drive but the effectiveness was nowhere even near the level that it is now. What's really interesting, like, you know, his mentor, um, and he's, for anyone that doesn't know Scott, he's a very interesting and unique individual because he has, like, I think he has over 30 companies. He has so many, and he has even more deals and partnerships, you know, that aren't even included in that 30, right? Like he has an insane ability to manage multiple projects at any given time that I've never seen before. So this is someone that has multiple companies, equity deals, is negotiating at least five or 10 deals at any given time and has like, I don't know, hundreds of entrepreneurs that he mentors in group programs. And then he has all these private clients. You know, it's, 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 a, it's a capacity that make, is beyond measure. It's like, how can a person do that? And what I've really observed with my own capacity over the last year and a half in particular is that my my capacity has dramatically grown and so where it is right now I have I have a book that I need to finalize so I've got I've done two drafts um so the third draft will be the final draft and then I have a sequel that I've started kind of penning and there's some progress there and then I have a third book that um, my team are helping me with and there's some progress there so there are like three books that are kind of simultaneously being worked on to some degree, but that's not the forefront of my day-to-day. And then I have my main business, which is the forefront of my day-to-day. I have um, two businesses that I'm an investor and an advisor in, and one is probably requires a bit more of my energy than the other. I have another opportunity right now that I'm negotiating and constructing 
Um, and then, yeah, I think, I think that's everything right. Oh yeah. I think that's everything right now. So that's multiple things that are requiring comment. And then I have, and then I have my clients, right. So then I have, I've now just taken on like four or five clients in, a, in an intimate, you know, sort of one-on-one hybrid kind of container, as well as all of the other stuff. Um, and there's no way I would have been able to do this even one year ago, let alone two, three, four, five years ago. So what's interesting here about this execution thing is that I think that the development of your ability to become effective and execute also has a a correlation with your capacity to manage multiple things at once and your capacity to hold more energy and have multiple conversations that are happening in different directions. And so I think a a big part of that, and I've always been a really big believer in, or not always, but I've become a really big believer in um, doing somatic work to regulate the nervous system and so I do breath work one-on-one with a really amazing breath worker in Bali. And we have a session every week. Um, I started doing breath work pretty seriously in October of 2021, September, October, 2021. And that was when things started to really shift and move. And I noticed that when I was doing this more regularly, when I was cold plunging more, and I was actually focusing on my heart rate variability um, that my physical capacity was what was very stretched and I could, I could do a lot more. I could hold a lot more. Um, and so, cause essentially if you look at the, the physiology, right, we, if we have a high amount of things that we're managing or things that are coming up, if we're not able to manage those things then the body is going to shut down, it's going to go into an overwhelm or a stress response. And when it, at the moment that it goes into a stress response, um, the the functioning center of the mind is going to shut down and it's not going to be able to problem solve. And so maintaining a high level of execution actually requires a high level of executive functioning in like the frontal, you know, the frontal cortex is right. So a really big part of going, well, how do I be more effective and how do I do high level strategic planning and how do I keep my, my brain able to, to manage and juggle and have high, com- like high levels of thought and conversation and problem solving requires the training the body to not go into states of overwhelm. And so that requires a level of regulation and balancing the sympathetic and the parasympathetic because they need to actually be in equal balance. So if your parasympathetic is going, you know, 10 one side, your sympathetic needs to also go 10 side and you need to be able to handle positive stress, you stress, not distress. And there's a really big difference between understanding, you know, the positive versus the negative stress, right? So I think that the body training is a massive part of it. And, you know, sleep is a really big contributor to the body training. Um, Strength training is a massive contributor. Um, Yeah, physical discomfort, like cold plunging, massive, massively. And I think any kind of breath and regulation movement, yoga, meditation is also going to train the physiology to stretch its heart rate variability and its capacity to have physical resilience um, to these types of things, which allows the mind to then go, oh, I'm online. I'm online and I'm okay. And so that's one half of it. And then the other half of it is having awareness of your motivations and going, what is it? Like, what is my goal? What is my focus? And being clear on the motivation that is driving you to take action towards that goal. Because most people don't take the time to get clear on what they want or why. The why is as important as the what. If you're not clear on why you want what you want, you won't move. We all need a motivation. We all need a reason. He who bears, you know, he who has a why can bear almost any how. So if you're really clear on the why, and if the why is deeply compelling, you will move. And I think that a big thing for most entrepreneurs in the context of building an online business, for example, is that most people are either motivated by survival or they tell themselves, you know, they, they pick an arbitrary money goal, but it's not meaningful enough. And so it's not connected enough to their core values. It's not connected enough to something that they deeply care about. There's, there's no mission beyond the ego or the self. And so there's, there's nothing that is driving them to actually endure the pain or the difficulty or the hardship required to keep going. So the, the meaning and the motivation is extremely important to give yourself an incentive, like to incentivize yourself, right? And this is the same with teams. Like when you become a leader and, and the leader of a business, you have to be able to clearly understand what is the incentive, what is the motivation for every single person on your team in order for that team to be effective. And they need to have an intrinsic motivation beyond just money. They need to have something that they're deeply inspired by so they want to contribute to the ecosystem. And that's something that as a leader, you need to figure out and learn how to do. And that's a whole ship right within itself. And then I think the third piece of this, so the first piece was the body. The second piece is understanding motivation. And the third piece to being effective 
is uh, navigating the emotional stuff when it comes up. Because something that I find is that most people will have a sense of what they want. They might even have a sense of how to get there, but then an emotional response will occur. And usually 90, I would say 90% of our time is, or 90% of our energy is spent in fighting the emotional response versus just being in a state of mental clarity. And they're being like, oh, cool. I know what to do. And I can, I, I can just do it. Because usually, so for, I'll, I'll give an example of like something that um, a student said in one of my programs a couple months ago. It was like, um, she needed to, to make a certain amount of money um, relatively quickly within like two weeks or something like that. Because she had a bill that was due. And she was like, well, I need to make like $10,000 because I have a mortgage payment and I'm really stressed because I am thinking about how am I going to make all of this money that is due really soon. And so she was in a loop of freaking out over the, the looming deadline and the amount of money and the velocity of all of that versus and then what that meant, you know, like, am I, have I failed? I'm not good. At, I'm not good at business. Should I even be doing business? And then all the self-doubt and all the stories come up. And so she was, she was swirling in all of these stories and trying to navigate the anxiety and the panic and then going, you know, but I've been in business for such a long time. And I, I, maybe I'm a money mindset coach. You know, I shouldn't be responding this way. And so most of it is going, I'm experiencing something. I shouldn't be experiencing something. What do I do about this emotional response that I'm having? And then we, the system just goes into total freak out. Because it's like, don't know what to do. And so, you know, then you obviously coach them through that, right? But it's like, as long as you're reacting and fighting the emotional response rather than just allowing it to pass through and accepting of it and not judging of it, most of us judge our responses, right? We're like, oh, I shouldn't be feeling this way. That's not okay. And so then we try and fight it. We avoid it, da, 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 rather than just being like, oh, cool. Like part of me is freaking out right now. I'm just going to observe that, allow it, surrender to it. Ah, uh, cool. Okay, cool. I'm going to have a cry. Ah, uh, done. Five minutes, move on. And so I think that, yeah, that emotional relationship is also going to carve out and give you like 90% of your energy back. One of the things that I've thoroughly enjoyed about this um, chat is the level of um thought and clarity around the fact that business is so much more than marketing and like i don't think we've spoken about any of those things and i fucking love this chat <laughs> so much like beyond I, I i one of the reasons i liked scott and there's a couple of other people in the space but there's not a huge amount is because he looks at business holistically and, and and as an ecosystem and you for me in this chat have spoken to that better than anyone that I've come across and I like I cannot understand how if you are a business coach or you're in that space and you're not considering these elements of business I don't know what the fuck you're doing because they as you've kind of spoken to for the last 45 minutes it's such a key ingredient to be able to understand how to regulate your nervous system, how to increase your window of tolerance, how to hold more, how to understand everything behind your inability to execute. Like you've just spoken to so much of it. And again, you know, I don't know if this is from your own struggles, but to be able to, yeah, be inclusive of all these important parts of business is like, for me, and again, I, I'm mindful that there's a bias because of the work and, and interest that I've got, but like, I do not understand how you do business without these now, personally. Yeah, I think there's a whole world out there of business owners that um, are not engaging in a level of emotional development or, yeah, this, this level of like conscious inquiry. And it is, it is very focused on the, the tactical side of things as the the only driver um and so you know that that is a large part of the world and you know, it, is, it is important to kind of understand that the tactical drivers are what creates the material reality you know like this is how the house is built um but the process of building the house is the process of building the house it's also part of it right and how you feel about building the house is part of it and then how quickly can you build the house how effectively can you build the house um is also a consideration. So I think now as we're kind of becoming more aware and, you know, I think in general, the collective is 
becoming more aware and actualizing that we are considering these things and they are waiting in a lot more. Completely agree. I could talk to you for hours and I'd like to. So ideally I'll get you back at some stage. Um, but for people to find out about you and the work that you do, where's the best spot for them to go? Uh, connect with me on Instagram. That's where I'm most active. Uh, I have a couple of freebies and things where you can learn more and just do some discovery on, um, you know, whatever floats your boat. If you're interested in human design, there's a free book um, which you can get my bio if you're interested in um, marketing and, and content strategy. There's also a mini course in my bio as well. So yeah, head over to IG and get entrenched. I do a lot of stories pretty regularly that can be pretty dynamic. So enjoy those. And depending when I get this out, you've got a messaging program starting soon, which I'm actually on the wait list for. So I'm looking forward to uh, exploring that as well. Phoebs, it's uh, been unreal, really unreal. And thank you for coming on the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you.